this is a short video about the new purple folder that came out in 2023, the health passport for adults with a learning disability. The reason it changed is was health professionals identified that the old purple folder gave too much information and didn't hone down on what they needed to know in order to be able to give equitable health outcomes. So the new purple folder really focuses on exact information that that health professional needs to know to be able to get health equitable health outcomes for that person. That's reasonable adjustments and good communication techniques and baseline information about the person. There is a guide online and we'll put a link at the bottom from the website and where you can find all the pages. And the guide talks you through exactly how to fill the pages in, but I'm also now gonna just give you a whistle stop tour of all the pages through the purple folder. The pages are now self printable. If you go to the website, you can download each of the documents you want to use and you can complete them electronically and potentially store them if you can do so safely so that you can update them and reprint them as and when you need them. So that's why we adapted it to being a process where you can continually update the purple folder, which is obviously far better. Um, the core pages are the first section of the purple folder and this is all that critical information to be able to enable the doctor to offer equitable health. It's all in the guide how to complete it but a couple of top tips are on this first page it'll say next of kin but it also makes reference to other key people. Please bear in mind that you know you may not be the next of kin but you may be the absolute expert in that person. You know them inside out you have cared for them for a long time and you know what their needs and wishes will be and you most importantly know how to help them to accept health care and how to help them be at ease and calm down so you are critical in there so please make sure you don't lose sight of that if you're that person who's not the next of kin but you know that person well so that we can make sure that the doctors listen to you as well as the next of kin so that's the first bit that I think is really key to bear in mind. We also have added in a section on vaccines to make sure it's recorded what vaccines they've had, because that's about being opportunistic. If this is someone who's reluctant to have vaccines, there may be another moment where they've become needing a blood test or needing sedation for something, and they can opportunistically ensure that all health elements are done at the same time. So having that information means you can be that driving force to saying, look, also I've noted he hasn't had these. Any chance we can do these at the same time? So you can be that extra strong voice. Health for someone with a learning disability is what we call the triangle. We need the expertise of all three to be able to get equitable health care. That's the person being as health aware as they possibly can be. You as the expert in the person and the health professional as the expert in health. If all three of you aren't working unitedly, somebody is going to end up without an equitable health care. We get then go on to the reasonable adjustments page. This is where you think about, again, your expertise. You know this person. What little things make that difference to them being able to accept things and be calm and be relaxed and be at ease and them not being able to accept it? That could be talk about dogs for three minutes, because if you talk about dogs, I'm going to relax. I'm going to feel at ease with you. And then I'm more likely to let you deliver your health intervention on me. That's a brilliant example of where a doctor may not engage with you if you said, oh, can you talk about dogs? But if you've written it in this section, it says, under the Equality Act, the reasonable adjustment I need is for you to talk to me about dogs for two minutes to enable me to calm down and trust you to deliver the health care. Then when you're in there, if the doctor says, oh, I haven't got time to do that, you can open that folder and say, Oh, no, I'm really sorry. Look, it's a reasonable adjustment under the Equality Act. This is what he needs to be able to accept health care. So think about those things that may help that person to be more tolerant. We've had someone else who has to have ABBA playing. You know, we've had someone who needs high fives at the door by the doctor. 
We've had someone who has to wait outside because they can't cope with waiting rooms and that's going to cause them major distress and then they won't tolerate going in and listening and accepting what's needed. So really think about what that could be for you, the person you are the expert in and help that process, making sure you record why. If you do this, this will enable them to calm down and or trust you. It's the same with the next page, the communication page. Under the accessible information standard, these are the communication methods I need. And that doesn't mean just saying, you know, I speak verbally or, you know, I use sign language. That's about knowing what they're communicating. So if you've got somebody who's non-verbal, you know, they may, I don't know, <coughs> bite their hands. That could be an indication that they're getting really distressed and don't want to be there. It could mean I'm really excited and I trust you within an inch of my life. So for the health professional, make sure they know, because what we don't want is someone saying, oh, they became agitated. So I stopped, you know, I stopped trying to treat them when in fact, you know that that's not agitated, that's happy. So think about those sorts of elements. For people who are more able, it may be somebody who lives independently, think about do they receive letters in the post themselves and are they likely to just bin them? Could you work with them to say, look, because you've been letters, can we ask the doctor to always send two copies and then I'll be able to remind you what's in the letter and we can work through it together? In which case that should be in there and notified to the doctors. Under accessible information standard, I need a duplicate sent to my sister because if you don't, I will bin my letter and not attend. That's another example. So it's just thinking again, think outside the box. You are the experts in the person. What do they need? And if you're not being listened to, you open that folder. You say, oh, I'm really sorry, this is really important. Under accessible information standard, this is what's needed for them to get equitable health outcomes. I won't go through all of the sections in the core because hopefully this has given you a bit of a taste of what you're looking to try and deliver in there. One of the other parts is the baseline. It says this is what I look like, act like and behave like when I'm well and when I'm unwell. And it's really important that you really consider what, again, your intelligence on that person, your knowledge, your expertise can state exactly what you know they they look like when they're unwell because you could have someone going in really calm and the doctor's saying oh he looks fine but you know that actually when he's that calm that means he's probably feeling absolutely at death's door so that's not an indication someone else could be leaping around they say well he doesn't look ill well actually he's at the point that the rest of us will be curled up in bed frozen and saying i can't bear to get up so do you see what I mean? It's that communication and how you know them and what that looks like. And also, again, there's a link to the me on my best day. If you've got the option or they have to do a smartphone 15 second video, just showing what the person's like on their best day, that can be sh shown to a doctor who may be not listening going, no, 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 this is what they look like when they're well. This is what they look like when they're unwell. And the link we're going to put in is to a video that some of the Purple All Stars have created to give you some examples of exactly what me on my best day could look like as a video. Just making that little video could be the difference between someone getting the healthcare they need at the right time and not. So please really consider whether you can do that. There's a baseline measurement section. Some of these you may do, some you may not, but the more you can do, the better. Just once every six months, checking through that list of things, you know, and doing those baseline measurements. Because if somebody's not able to communicate as effectively as the rest of us, what they're feeling and what they're experiencing, some of those baseline measurements could really show, you know, how unwell they are. So if there's been a significant change in their weight or in their blood pressure has changed or, you know, so... If you keep a record, that shows what their normal is, and then we can see if there's dramatic changes. So again, you can say to the doctor, no, look, this, this is their baseline. There's other pages in there too. There's um, elements about the annual health check and getting the doctor to record that the annual health check has been completed. 
and making sure you get that health check action plan out of that. There'll be another video around our new health checks and health check action plans and the stay healthy at home checklist. So please watch that to make sure you are able to support the person you help to get a fully comprehensive annual health check each year as well. There's still what used to be the yellow pages, which is the um, health appointment record. And it's really important that that still gets completed. Just one line by the clinician to say what they sold them for. But now we're doing a lot more virtual. It is OK for you to put the one line on there and summarise that if, if needs be. But obviously, if we can get the health professional to, that's much better if, you know, if it's a face to face appointment. That's because that shows in one place a whistle stop summary of all the health interventions they've had, because there could be interlinking issues which won't be picked up if it's not just very whistle stop put in one place. So that's why that's important. It is not the place for the health professional to write the full actions that are going to come out of it. If the person needs that recorded because they're independent or there's lots of actions going to happen, there are now self-printable blank pages which you can put in the folder as blanks, which are what, is, what are the actions after today's appointment pages. That page, you can then say, could you summarise this on here because they live semi-independently or independently and we're going to need to remind them each day what it was you said. So that's where you can summarise that, you know, get the health professional to summarise that on that page. But again, you highlight why the person needs it, not why you need it as a carer, but why the person needs it. The person needs this written down by you so we can reinforce to them what it was you said. So that's when you use that page. There are other blank pages as well that you need to keep stored in there, ready for use when the moment arises. One of them is health interventions that I'm currently undergoing. So if the person is currently under a physio or under a community learning disability nurse or occupational therapist, you could use that page for ask that clinician to summarise what's currently going on and what their work is so that on the other page they can just put working for six months with this person but the summary of what they're trying to achieve is in there so if the person ends up in hospital the hospital can quickly see what other interventions are going on so for example if somebody was under the epilepsy nurse and undergoing a medication reduction the plan is there so if they end up in hospital, the hospital don't undo all the great work that's happened by whacking them back on the medication that they've come off. And they quickly link in with that clinician who is involved with them. So they're really important to have filled in so that you've got that summary of what's currently going on for that person. Another blank page is one around mental capacity, because we keep hearing that doctors may ask a carer to help them with a mental capacity assessment and carers are saying no that's the doctor's job absolutely it is the doctor's job to do the mental capacity assessment but mental capacity is around helping that person to understand what the plan is and why it's needed now if you think about it who's the best person to try and get that information across to the person in the way they're going to understand best that's you guys you're the experts in the person. So what we've done is create a document where the doctor writes down exactly what they need the person to try and understand. And then you can go away in the time frame given to you by that doctor. So depending on how risky the situation is, how quickly they need that decision for you to then be able to work with the person in all the ways that work best with them to try and understand as much as possible then you feed back to the doctor, this is the level that I could get them to be able to understand. This is what I did and this is how they responded. And then the doctor reaches the decision whether they have the mental capacity to make an informed decision based on the person's understanding after you have done your work with them. So there's blank ones in there. So if the doctor says to you, we need to... Um, See if he understands that he needs this blood test because we fear he's got diabetes. You, you know, can you go home and explain that to him? You can say, yep, yeah, no problem. Write down exactly what he needs to understand. 
and how long have I got? When do you want me to come back to you? Because it was, you know, with where he's at with this, how dangerous is the situation? You get that on the form and then you can go away and then return with what you've achieved from that. The last page I want to talk through is the reluctance for blood test page. This is because we know lots of people with a learning disability really struggle with needle phobia and reluctance for blood tests. And often they end up not having a blood test they require. So again, this is down to trying to stop those delays by using the intelligence and knowledge you have of that person to be able to get that down. So what it states on it is previous experience what has been their previous level of understanding relating to having a blood test and what has been tried in the past that didn't work because the, and what's been tried that did work because then we can try and ensure that that's all actioned to speed up the process and it's not always back to step one when someone needs bloods so it's really key that you get that completed so that you're ready and on standby for when somebody might need a blood test next that if they're only, you know, it's previously been tried in hospitals, uh, in doctor's surgeries and, you know, in all sorts of reasonable adjustments being tried and they've all failed. And the only way they've ever had successful bloods is by someone coming to the home. It has to be first thing in the morning because that's their best time of day. And the person has to come wearing a Mickey Mouse T-shirt and singing um, Do Re Mi Fa So La Ti Do. Anything like that. Do you see what I mean? So, you know, and we have exactly those situations have cropped up where that is the only way it's been achieved. So get that intelligence down. You know, we've had someone who will only have it when the person comes dressed up as Harry Potter. You know, let's face it, if that's what the clinician needs to do, let's get that intelligence down rather than us always starting back at square one. So that's a brief summary. There's a guide that's on the website. There's also two completed folders so you can sort of sort of look at those and sort of think about the wording and sort of um, gain some insight from the two that have been completed on how maybe you can word the information for the person you support. Um, there's our email address so we're always happy to answer questions and to sort of support in that way with how you complete them. But most importantly, remember the purple folder is only as good as the wording in it and how you use it. So if a doctor isn't looking in it and you think there's information in it that's really going to help that person get the health care they need, you need to be the one who opens it and says, no, sorry, you need to read this. This is really important to get equitable health for this person. You are experts. Don't forget that. You're the experts in the person. Doctors and nurses are experts in health and the person is also an expert in themselves. And so how they are portraying themselves is needed as well. Good luck and please come back to us if there's anything we can do to help. <laughs>